uh, during this time that is tumultuous uh, in so many ways. Let's start with um, impeachment. The point of impeachment and conviction in the Senate, of course, is to remove a president from office. But he's not going to be president anymore after Wednesday at noon. So why even go through with the Senate trial? Well, the Constitution, of course, talks about conviction, removal, and disqualification from holding further public office. Um, I don't think anybody would seriously argue that we should establish a precedent where every president on the way out the door has two weeks or three weeks or four weeks to try to incite an armed insurrection against the union or uh, organize a coup against the union. And if it succeeds, he becomes a dictator. And if it fails, he's not subject to impeachment or conviction because uh, we just want to let bygones be bygones. This was the most serious presidential crime in the history of the United States of America, the most dangerous crime by a president ever uh, committed against the United States. And there are Republicans who are recognizing it, as well as Democrats. I want to single out my colleague Liz Cheney, uh, who I think perfectly synthesized our situation, Jake. She said that Donald Trump summoned the mob, assembled the mob, he lit the match that led to the violent insurrection. None of it would have happened without mm -hmm. him. Everything is due to his actions. Um, and this was the most uh, sweeping betrayal, uh, the most terrible betrayal of a presidential oath in office in the history of the United States. Liz Cheney, of course, the number three House Republican, a very conservative Republican uh, congresswoman from uh, Wyoming. And, now, the organ, and she is the elected chair of yeah. the House Republican Conference. Yes, although she's now under fire by a lot of House Republicans. You said um, the president poses a clear and present danger to the, to the nation. Um, so if that's true, why has the article of impeachment not yet been delivered to the Senate, and when do you plan to do so? Well, the, the Senate has not been in session, and so the Speaker is organizing the formal transfer of uh, the articles, and it should be coming up soon. I know the Speaker also considers the President a clear and present danger to the Republic. So, uh, when, would, when do you think it will be delivered to the Senate? You Senate's? know, I don't know. I haven't spoken to the Speaker today about this. And look, you know, I, I, I know that everybody wants to focus on trial tactics and strategy and so on. I want people to focus on the solemnity and the gravity of these events. Five Americans are dead because a violent mob was encouraged, exhorted, and incited by the President of the United States of America, which broke into the Congress of the United States, into the Capitol, and came within a hair's breadth of hanging Vice President Pence. I mean, the ears, the, the, the words are still ringing in the ears of the members. Hang Mike Pence. Hang Mike Pence. They, uh, they built a gallows outside the Capitol of the United States. There was uh, an assassination party hunting for Nancy Pelosi. So this cannot be at the level of normal partisan push and pull and just kind of throwing rhetorical brickbats back and forth. This was an attack on our country. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't disagree. Um, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I know you want to focus on that, but, but there are tactical questions I do have to ask just in of terms course. of how this is going to work. Um, for instance, uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell noted that the last impeachment trial took 21 days. Do you think that's about how long this one will take? Well, uh, every prosecutor in this case on my team, and I've got an extraordinary team of prosecutors, uh, anyone who ends up defending the president, every senator who is a juror in this case uh, is also a witness to these events. We were all witnesses. Indeed, we were victims uh, to this event. Um, the Senate parliamentarian, Elizabeth McDonough, had to flee her office, and uh, thank God that she brought uh, the mahogany box with her that contained the Electoral College vote. So you're saying you don't need to call witnesses because they all saw it? Uh, well, no, but I, I'm not going to get into trial strategy, but I guess what I'm saying is if you invade a police headquarters and you ransack and rampage the place and you kill officers and people working in the police headquarters, you don't need a six-month investigation to determine what happened. The impeachment is an indictment. These are the charging articles, and we are going to conduct the trial in the Senate according to the rules that the Senate provides for. It's not up to the House. It is up to the Senate 
to define all of those rules. And I, I trust that all 100 senators will live up to their constitutional oath of office as senators, but also live up to their oath of office as jurors. Big, because big they, difference, though, this time as opposed to the impeachment of last year, which is this time Democrats will control the Senate uh, because Democrats won those last two uh, Senate seats in Georgia. Uh, so I guess the question is, um, witnesses were not allowed last time because the Republicans voted against it, uh, with a couple exceptions. Will you want witnesses this time? And if so, who? Would you want Capitol Hill police officers? Do you want, I mean, we see a lot of the lawyers representing um, the insurrectionists, the terrorists, are now putting out legal documents saying that they were just, you know, these people were just following the president's orders, yes. et cetera. I mean, will you have witnesses? Um, I've got um, extraordinary uh, former prosecutors on my team, Stacey Plaskett, uh, Ted Lieu, incredible lawyers, uh, Joe Neguse, uh, um, you know, just uh, Madeline Dean, the very finest, and we're putting together um, a trial plan which is designed to get the truth of all of these events out. Now, uh, obviously, we're not going to be able to tell everyone's story, but we're going to be able to tell the story of this attack on America and uh, all of the events that led up to it. This president set out to dismantle and overturn the election results from the 2020 presidential election. He was perfectly clear about that. He described it as a fraud, a scam. He said it was a stolen election, and he continued to exhort his followers to do everything in their power uh, to overturn the election result. Well, it's interesting that you say that, because I was going to ask you, um, obviously, President Trump had been setting the stage for this for months, even before the election, uh, with these lies, the big lie. The big lie. And um, that, that the election was stolen, that it was fraudulent. Um, the an article of impeachment mainly focuses on the January 6 incitement, uh, the speech that the president gave. It, it, it gives a, a glancing acknowledgment that it wasn't the first time he said it, but it focuses on January 6. Given the fact that we know some of this was planned, now we're getting an indication from law enforcement that some of the people were not incited that morning, they were incited in previous weeks and months, uh, does that affect your case? Well, of course, the fact that it was uh, deliberated and planned and premeditated underscores the leadership and the complicity of Donald Trump in all of these events. Uh, he was out propagandizing his followers, as you say, for months, first to prepare them that his loss would have to be a fraud. There's no way otherwise he could have lost. And then to attack the election results. And some of that took place in utterly freakishly absurd ways, like 61 lawsuits, all of which were thrown out and rejected and repudiated by judges, uh, a lot of them Trump-appointed judges. But, the, but, but then it turned to right. uh, egging on a mob, right. uh, as uh, Liz Cheney put it, assembling the mob, convoking the mob, inciting the mob. But all of uh, it will be part of the, the trial. The, the entire stream of events leading up to this attack on the Capitol. Now, understand, January 6th is not a random date. It wasn't like the president said, well, maybe we'll do it November 11th, or maybe I'll call everybody to town December 2nd. Maybe I'll tell them it'll be wild for December 9th, or tell the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by for December 14th. No, January 6th is the day set in the Electoral Count Act in coordination with the 12th Amendment of the Constitution for Congress to meet in bipartisan session, in bicameral session, all of the members there together to count the Electoral College votes. And this is supposed to be a ministerial pro forma kind of action where we count the electoral votes sent in by the states. We know that the president brought enormous pressure to bear on uh, Vice President Pence to step out of his constitutional oath and outside of his constitutional role simply to reject the results that President Trump didn't like. Yeah. And Vice President Prince, Pence refused to do it, which is why there was a mob that came within seconds of catching him yelling, hang Mike Pence. And then it turned to exhorting the mob, saying, go and fight like hell or you're going to lose your country. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you. But so it's all of it. Um, I, I want to uh, turn now to a different subject um, because I think it's a lot of people watching know how remarkable it is uh, that you have the energy a a to do what you're doing, um, given the fact that you're dealing with a family tragedy. You lost your son, 25-year-old you know, Tommy, uh, to depression. You wrote a very moving reflection on his, quote, perfect heart, a perfect soul, a riotously outrageous and relentless sense of humor, and a dazzlingly 
dazzling, radiant mind. Um, my, my wife, Sarah, and I wrote this together. Um, tell, tell us more about, about Tommy. Um, well, uh, Tommy was a remarkable person. Um, he had overwhelming love for humanity and for our country uh, in his heart and really for all the people of the world. Uh, we lost him on the very last day of that god-awful year, 2020, um, and he left us a note um, which said, please forgive me, uh, my illness won today. Look after each other, the animals, and the global poor for me. All my love, Tommy. Um, and that was the last act in a life that uh, dazzled um, anybody who came into uh, contact with Tommy. He was uh, a slam poet who wrote these magnificent 20, 30-minute poems, which he, of course, knew by heart, uh, and he would get up and perform them. Um, he was absolutely devoted to human rights for every person. He was devoted to animal rights and welfare. He was a passionate vegan and convinced a lot of people to stop eating animals mm -hmm. just through the force of his poetry. Uh, he was a, a second-year student at Harvard Law School. I mean, he was uh, a beautiful kid. When we lost him, he had um, not only beloved friends at Harvard Law School, but he was teaching uh, a course with Michael Sandel, Justice, uh, as a teaching fellow uh, at the college, and so he had students of his own, and uh, he graded all of his papers and exams and wrote many pages analyzing the work of the students and writing back to them. And he made donations in each of their names to different charitable groups that he thought would be consistent with the values of the student. And so some of them went to uh, give directly or to Oxfam or so on. And um, uh, I asked him why he did that. And he quoted um, something that Father Berrigan had said about the great Dorothy Day. He said, uh, well, like Father Berrigan said about Dorothy Day, she lived as though the truth were true. And he said, I want to show them um, that the truth is true and we can live that way. So, um, you know, people are asking me uh, why I decided to do this. First of all, uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to say no to Speaker Pelosi about anything, uh, but she's actually been very sensitive and thoughtful. But um, she wanted me to do it because she knows that I've devoted my life to the Constitution and to the Republic. I'm a professor of constitutional law. Um, but I did it really uh, with my son in my heart uh, and helping lead the way. I feel him in my chest. Um, when we went to count the Electoral College votes and it came under that ludicrous attack, um, I felt my son with me. Uh, and I was most concerned with uh, our youngest daughter and my son-in-law, who's married to our other daughter, who were with me that day, who got caught in a room off of the House floor. And between them and me was a rampaging armed mob that could have killed them easily and was banging on the doors where they were hiding under a desk with my chief of staff, Julie Tagan. These events are personal to me, Jake. There was an attack on our country. There was an attack on our people. There are thousands of people who work on Capitol Hill, not just members, but staff members and Capitol Hill police officers who were pushed and shoved and punched in the face, pummeled and hit over the head with fire extinguishers. And the President of the United States did nothing to stop it for more than two hours as members of Congress were calling him and begging him to do something. And he continued to watch it on TV and to enjoy their, you know, insurrection tailgate party where they were celebrating the attack on our democracy. This president has been impeached already twice, and we just want the Senate to conduct a serious trial where every member of the Senate lives up to his or her constitutional oath to render impartial yeah. judgment as a juror. Congressman, I, I mean, I, I, I can't even begin to express my condolences for what you and your wife and, and your daughters and, and family are, are, are dealing with. I can't also imagine having that trauma compounded with this other trauma. You, you just lost your son, and now you're in Congress worrying about your daughter and your other daughter's husband because of these terrorists who had attacked the Congress. That trauma on top of trauma I, just seems so debilitating. Well, 
I, you know, I'm not going to lose my son at the end of 2020 and lose my country and my republic in 2021. It's not going to happen. Um, and um, the vast majority of the American people, uh, Democrats, Republicans, and independents, reject armed insurrection and violence as a new way of doing business in America. We're, we're not going to do that. This was the most terrible crime ever by a president of the United States against our country. And I want everybody to feel the gravity and the solemnity of those events at the same time, of course, that all of us are deeply invested in President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris moving the country forward to repair all of the wreckage and the damage of last year on everything from COVID-19 to the economy. But I was thinking on the way over this morning, Jake, about the preamble to the Constitution. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, and promote the general welfare, and preserve to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of liberty, do hereby ordain and establish. We have to do all of those things at the same time. We have to establish justice. We have to ensure domestic tranquility at the same time we are promoting the general welfare. But mm -hmm. this is America, and the people are up to it, and we've got uh, a new administration coming to town that is ready to lead America back on the road of progress. As somebody who watched your son deal with this disease of depression, yes, I have to also note that so many Americans right now have been struggling with mental health during this pandemic and then frankly during this time of insurrection, during this time where it seems like millions of Americans, because they have been lied to over and over by the president and his, and his allies on Cong in Congress and in the media, believe this big lie. One in four, according to the CDC, one in four Americans under the age of 25 have seriously considered um, taking their own lives in the last 30 days, according to the CDC. Um, one in four. Uh, what is your message to people who are dealing with this horrible disease, or to the loved ones they have, as a dad who, who watched your beloved Tommy struggle with this disease? Well, um, we don't want to lose anybody else. Um, we've been hearing from thousands and thousands of people across the country, and if any of them are out there, uh, thank you for your kindness to our family, and we will somehow get a chance to reply to everyone, but your messages, your heartfelt messages, uh, come as a comfort and a solace to us. And we know how many millions of people uh, have struggled with depression, how many millions of families have dealt with it. Um, and uh, there are obviously complicated neurochemical and psychological causes to that, and we want to make sure we're investing uh, the resources of the country to deal with it. So. One day, there'll be a year where nobody uh, loses their life because of depression and other forms of emotional and mental illness. But on a personal uh, note, if you could speak to the people out there who, who are struggling or who have loved ones who are struggling, what, what do you want to tell them? I would say um, that, um, as someone wrote me, it's a, it's a permanent answer to a temporary condition and predicament. And I don't mean to understate it, because we know how much terrible pain our son was in. Um, one of our daughters said that Tommy was, above all, a utilitarian. He wanted to promote the happiness and the well-being for as many people and as many animals as possible and reduce as much pain and suffering as possible. So if he did this, uh, Tabitha said, um, he weighed the pain and suffering that would be caused to us against the pain and suffering that he was going through, the agony that he was going through, and found that that was worse. Or, Tabitha said, he committed the very first selfish act of his life. And she didn't believe that he did that. He was not a selfish person. Mm. Uh, he lived in honor of the people he loved. He loved his family, and we loved him. He loved his friends, and uh, they loved him. Um, and um, it's But as you note, it's a, it's a it's a permanent solution for a temporary problem. The problem can be dealt with. The problem 
can be treated, the problem yes. can go away. Well, that, that, that's what I meant to say. Is that we can get people through this. Um, you must speak to people in your family. You must speak to your doctor. You must call 911 if you're alone and that's necessary. The, don't, uh, don't go down that road. Um, that's very clear to us. And I'm no expert, but I know that we can address it. We can deal with it together. So um, I, I'm hoping that everybody understands that there's a lot of love out there. You know, in, in Tommy's case, the outpouring of love and affection for him has been uh, absolutely astounding. We set up a memorial fund, the Tommy Raskin Fund for People and Animals, which now has more than like $400,000 in it. His classmates at Harvard Law School raised like five or $6,000 uh, to put that in so that the causes he believed in would keep going. Um, but we don't have to wait for people to die for people to listen to them. We can listen to you right now. We so, are, yeah, exactly, we are, we are here. We are here. We are here for you. And, and Congressman, I want to thank you um, for, for um, coming here and sharing the story and uh, anything we can do to help uh, in terms of promoting the Tommy Raskin Fund or anything else. Uh, may his memory be a blessing. Let me just uh, tell our viewers, if you are feeling as though you are in crisis in any way, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It's 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-8255. Uh, Congressman, again, thanks for being with us. And thank you for having me, Jim. May Tommy Raskin's memory be a blessing. We'll be right back after this.